nuptial hour draws on apace, four happy days bring in another moon. But oh, methinks, how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires, like to a stepdame or a dowager, long withering out a young man's revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night, four nights will quickly dream away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Go for the straight. Stir up the Athenian youth to merriment. Awake the pert and nimble spirit of mirth. Turn melancholy forth to funerals. The pale companion is not for our pomp. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword, and won thy love doing thee injuries. But I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Happy be Theseus, our renowned Duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation come I with a complaint against my child, my daughter. Hermia. Stand forth, Demetrius. My noble lord, this man hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander. And my gracious duke, this man hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast, by moonlight, at her window, sung with feigning voice verses of feigning love, and stolen the impression of her fantasy. With cunning, thou hast filched my daughter's heart, turned her obedience, which is mine, to stubborn harshness. And so, my gracious Duke, be it so she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death. According to our law, immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid. To you, your father should be as a god. Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. In himself he is. But in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looked, but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such presence here to plead my thoughts. But I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case, if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, Question your desires, know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether, if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun, for a to be in shady cloister mewed, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting faint hymns to the cold, fruitless moon. Thrice bless they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage, but earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in single blessedness. So will I grow, so live, so die, my lord, ere I will my virgin patent up unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me, the everlasting bond of fellowship, <laughs> Upon that day, either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius, as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest for a austerity and single life. 
relent, sweet Hermia, and Lysander yield <laughs> thy grace title to my certain right. You have her father's love, Demetrius. Let me have Hermia's. Do you marry him? Don't fall, Lysander. True, he hath my love, and what is mine, my love shall render him. And she is mine, and all my right of her I do estate unto Demetrius. I am, my lord, as well derived as he, as well possessed. My love is more than his, and which is more than all these boasts can be. I am beloved of beauteous Hermia. Why should I not then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nadar's daughter, Helena, and won her soul, and she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry upon this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius thought to have spoke thereof, but being over full of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But Demetrius, come, and come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you both. For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means you may extenuate to death, or to a vow of single life. Come, my Hippolyta. What's cheer, my love? Demetrius and Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer with you of something near you that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire, we will follow you. How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Like for want of rain, which I could well between them from the tempest of my eyes. Ay me, for aught that I ever could read, could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth, but either it was different in blood... Or... How cross too high to be enthralled so low! Or else misgraft in respect of years! How oh, spite, too old to be engaged so young! Or else it stood upon the choice of friends. Ah, oh, hell! To choose love by another's eyes! Or if there were a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it. If then true lovers have ever been crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Let us then teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to lovers' thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, Poor fancy's followers. Nah, good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, uh, a dowager of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house, remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. Bear, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee. And to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. Uh, if, if thou lovest me then, Steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the wood, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena, to do observance to a morn of May, there will I stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with a golden head, by all the vows that men have ever broke, in numbers more than women ever spoke, in the same place that thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Oh, look, here comes Helena. Godspeed, fair Helena. Whither away? Call you me fair, that fair again unsay. Demetrius loves your fair, oh happy fair. Your eyes are load stars, your tongue sweet air, more tunable to lark than shepherd's ear. When wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear, sickness is catching, oh, a favour so. Yours would I catch, fair Hermia, ere I go. My ear should catch your voice, my eye your eye, my tongue should catch your tongue sweet melody. Were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'd give to be to you translated. Oh, teach me how you look and with what art. You sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smile such skill. I give him curses, yet he gives me love. 
oh, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty, would that fault were mine. Take comfort, he shall no more see my face. Lysander and myself will flee this place. Before the time I did Lysander see, seemed Athens' as paradise to me. Oh then, what graces in my love do dwell, that he hath turned a heaven unto hell. Helen, to you our minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night, when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass, decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, a time that lovers' flights doth still conceal, through Athens' gates we have devised to steal. And in the wood, where often you and I, upon faint primrose beds, were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet. And thence from Athens turn away our eyes, to seek new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow, pray thou for us, and good luck grant me thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lover's food till tomorrow, deep midnight. I will. My Hermia. Helena, adieu. As you on him, Demetrius dote upon How happy some or other some can be. Through Athens I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And as he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I, admiring of his qualities, things base and vile, folding no quantity, Love can transpose to form and dignity. Love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind, and therefore is winged Cupid painted blind. <clears throat> Nor hath love's mind of any judgment taste. Wings and no eyes figure unheady haste. And therefore is love said to be a child, because in choice he is so oft beguiled. As waggish boys and gain themselves forswear, so the boy love is perjured everywhere. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when this hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he deserved, dissolved, and showers of oaths did melt. I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight, then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her, and for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain, to have his sights thither and back again. Is all our company here? You were best to call them generally, man by man, according to the script. Here's the scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit through all Athens, to play our interlude before the Duke and Duchess on his wedding night at day. First, Good Peter's quits. Say what the play treats on, and then read the names of the actors, and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A very good piece of work, I assure you, and a merry. Now, good Peter Quince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Master, spread yourselves. Answer as I call you. Nick Bottom, the weaver. Ready? What part am I for? And proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover? A tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallantly for love. Uh, that will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. <laughs> I will move storms. I will condole in some measure uh, to the rest, yet my chief humour is for a tyrant. I could play Hercules really. Or a part of Terra Kane to make all split. <coughs> The raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates, and Phoebus's car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish 
fights. <laughs> that was lofty. <laughs> now, name the rest of the players. This is Hercules' vein, a tyrant's vein. A, a lover is a uh, more condoling. Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Oh, here, Peter Quince. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. And what is Thisbe, a wandering knight? <laughs> it is the lady that Pyramus must love. Nay, Faith, let me not play a woman. I have a bid coming. That's all one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. If I may hide my face, let me play Thisbe too. I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisbe, Thisbe. Ah, oh, Pyramus, love, dear. Oh, thy Thisbe, dear, thine lady, dear. No, no, you must play Pyramus and flute you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Robin Starveling, the tailor. Yeah, Peter Quince, here. Yeah. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout, the tinker. Yeah, hey, Peter Quince. You, Pyramus' father. Myself, Thisbe's father. Snug, the joiner, you, the lion's part. And I hope here is a play fitted. Uh, have you the lion's part written? Pray you, if it be, give it me, for I am slow of study. Uh, you may do it ex tempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion too. I will roar that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar that I will make the duke say, Let him roar again! Let him roar again! If you should do it too terribly, you would fright the duchess and the ladies, that they would shriek and that... We're enough to hang us all. I, I grant you, friends, that uh, if you should frighten the ladies out of their wits, um, they would have no more discretion but to hang us. But I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any suckling dove. <laughs> you, you can play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man, as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely gentleman-like man. Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I will undertake it. Um, what beard were I best to play it in? Why, what you will. I will discharge it in either the straw-coloured beard your orange tawny beard, or your purple ingrain beard, or your French crown beard, your perfect yellow. <laughs> Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play barefaced. But masters, here are your parts. I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night, and meet me in the palace wood, a mile without the town, by moonlight, there we will rehearse, for if we meet in the city, well, we shall be dogged with company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of properties such as our play wants. I pray you, I pray you, fail me not. We will meet, and there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pains, be perfect, adieu. At the Duke's Oak, we meet. Enough! Hold! I'll cut bowstrings! <laughs>